Hello? Hey. Thank you so much for interviewing with us. So you're going to speak about interneurons at SFM this year, is that correct? I will. I was wondering, when we learn in grad school about interneurons, we're always taught that they're like the brakes on a car when the glutamatergic neurons are like the gas. So I was wondering, what was the big turning point in this field that threw light on focusing on these inhibitory interneuron cell types? Somewhere around about a decade ago, my lab was really much more focused on patterning and organization of the brain. And really what we were really focused on is the differential organization of the striatum, which is a big ungainly ball of string with no obvious internal structure versus the cortex, which is highly ordered in layers and columns and how those two differences come about. And as part of that, I was very curious about the two on Laga that most likely gave rise to subcortical structures actually three, what are called the ganglionic eminences. And we did a kind of a basic developmental biology project where we said, well, let's fate map them and find out where and what these areas give rise to. So what we found was that two of these areas gave rise to cortical interneurons and that what was striking is the CG and the MG gave rise to different types. So suddenly I was thrown unceremoniously into the world of interneuron diversity and I started reading about what interneurons do and what I discovered was that they do a lot more, or at least the hints from the people who had done functional analysis, is they do a lot more than just apply breaks to excitation. So when you were a graduate student or even before that, were you spurred by the whole biology of interneurons back then, or did you pave your way into it as you began other things? I actually did my grad school work on striatal development. Now, the entire okay. striatum is GABAergic, so it's inhibitory. And the interneurons then uh, worked by Empson had shown that the different interneurons had different peptide markers, which seemed interesting. There was actually a lot of high-profile stuff on it. And to be honest, I, in the end, concluded they were, as you said, the break. Something that just was inhibitory and stopped excitation seemed pretty damn dull to me, and I never paid much attention to them. So no, at that point, I knew of them, I was aware of them, and I completely missed what was interesting about them. So in development of the brain, at what point do you think interneurons start playing a role? Well, I don't know if you're aware, but the thought is that early in development, interneurons are actually born a little bit ahead of the excitatory cells. And okay. prior to somewhere between postnatal day 6 to postnatal day 10 in mice, which probably corresponds to late embryonic development in humans, interneurons are thought to be depolarizing. So you might say excitatory, but I, I say depolarizing deliberately because I don't think they're actually excitatory per se. They're not causing action potentials, but they do, when they release GABA, tend to make the cells they impinge upon depolarize rather than hyperpolarize. And so the idea is here's a way of, in a very controlled manner during development, to provide excitation in the cortex in a very unruly system where the system does not have the tight organization it would have later, but you need excitation to help organize the system, and interneurons seem to be implicated in helping to organize the way the brain functions through that early depolarizing action. With the advent of translational medicine, do you think interneurons might have a role to play in the pathophysiology of disorders? Yeah, I, I think the jury is still out exactly what their role is, but the hint that dysfunction of interneurons is one cause of affective disorders seems to be a highly favored hypothesis, which I tend to buy into. You know, and did work by David Lewis and Chris Moore have, in different ways, indicated David's work on looking at humans and looking at what looks like failed basket cell function in the superficial parts of prefrontal cortex. And Chris Moore, who's in model systems, indicated that the same population is needed to create gamma band activity. They provide some real hints that there's a direct association between interneuron function and disease. I think the other line of evidence that supports it is that many of the genes that are linked to affective disorders are genes that are expressed in interneurons, suggesting that the interneurons may be the causal link in some of these diseases. So, I, I, you know, that's a cautious yes. And, okay. uh, yeah, I like the idea that if we can manipulate interneuron function, we perhaps can help in disorders. What is it that we should look forward to at your presidential lecture at SFM? 
I honestly think that the last 100 years, but more particularly with interneurons, things have really ramped up in the last 20 years. We've begun to get a handle on this diversity and how both it's created and how it contributes to brain function. If I succeed, I'd really like to give people a perspective of why interneurons are exciting, how that diversity is created. And I think it both has a functionally interesting side, which is how does your brain self-wire itself and how do interneurons contribute to that? And then on the pathophysiology side, it's going to be hopefully somewhat informative to give hints about the relationship between what happens when these cells dysfunction as a etiology for these kinds of disorders. That's fascinating. How did you get to where you were today, if you were to briefly describe? I got very <laughs> lucky. That would be the very brief description. You know, it would be easy to pretend that I think careful, thoughtful, well-reasoned arguments and a careful set of hard-won experiments were why my lab's done pretty well. The truth is, as an experimentalist, you realize that unless you have a control, you don't know whether the result was just lucky or, or would have worked out this way every time. So until I can relive my life 10 times and see that in all cases my lab worked out well, I'm going to rest with the idea that my lab worked out well because I was extremely lucky. Probably made some good decisions along the way, but anyone who doesn't appreciate luck in their success is probably uh, a little <laughs> too egocentric for my taste. One of our next questions in the segment was actually how much of a successful scientist is luck and how much of it is hard work? Well, there you go. I think that what people sometimes miss, and this has been said well over uh, 100 years ago in science, that when we look at what we know, we kind of assume there are books written like the end of science. And I think that the mistake people make is thinking that we understand more than we do. And so they view success in science as you'd have to be incredibly lucky to find something interesting to work on. And in fact, I think if we're careful, nature uh, will tell you some of its secrets. And it's a target-rich zone. There's a lot out there in biology, particularly in neurobiology, which we just don't understand. And yeah, I think it's luck to hit upon the right idea and to recognize that you can make a go of it. But on the other hand, I think it's easy to uh, overlook those opportunities when they come along. So I think that everyone needs a little luck to get going in the right direction. But there's a lot out there. And if you work hard and you pick an area which is interesting, I think the opportunities will come. Yeah, so it's that luck and perseverance, they go hand in hand, I guess, in science. Well, first you need luck, and then you need the recognition of that luck to see the opportunity, and then you need to work really hard. <laughs> yeah. So did you always want to be a scientist? Um, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a little unusual, I think, in that when I was growing up, I had an absolute fascination with science fiction, and I was always drawn towards hard science fiction, which was people who extrapolated on scientific knowledge to see what you could do with it. So as much as I wanted to be a scientist came from the idea that I was always fascinated by applications of science in terms of what you could do with it. And only later did I get interested in being a scientist per se. As a matter of fact, I decided I was going to be a scientist somewhere around December 16th, 1983. And I'm probably no more than three or four days off either way. And that <laughs> was the holiday party in the Medical Science Building in the University of Toronto. And I was an undergrad doing an experiment for my fourth year thesis project. And I did this experiment where I was looking at whether the strial nigro projections in the striatum coincide with the early nigro striatal projections that occur reciprocally. And I discovered that they did, which may sound like a really kind of a dull result. But you know, here I was, a fourth year undergrad, and I realized I knew something that no one in the entire world knew. And I sat that in that little dark room while everyone else was drinking cocktails because I had decided to go look at this result before the party. And I just thought, wow, that is the biggest rush I've ever had in my life. And that's when I decided I was going to be a scientist right there. Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> it's very exciting. So tell us a little bit about how you were in grad school. Well, it's always a little hard to be too self-aware of how you look, particularly at that young age. I remember that in grad school, I had a colleague named Tony Buschera, uh, who was a grad student with me and was writing my thesis, and I walked into our coffee room, 
and there was a childish drawing of me with a giant head walking around with a big pile of books in my arm, and the title said, Gord Writing His Thesis. And I was like, wow, is that really how they perceive me? So, you know, I don't know. I think I would say I haven't changed that much. I was always excited about a million and one things and jumping from idea and idea to idea, trying to figure out something cool to work on. Perhaps I've got a little better at sorting them out before I blurt them to other people now. But I think I always did have that kind of frenetic excitement about science and had a high level of enthusiasm. But if you really want to know how I was in grad school, you'd have to talk to Tony Bashir and other people who I did <laughs> grad school with. Fair enough. And what's your favorite memory from grad school? I know grad school has a lot of memories, but if there was one that you really hold on to close to your heart, what might that be? It's hard to point out. I mean, obviously, the best parts were where I felt I discovered something. I really loved doing grad school. I mean, one of the things I see in my postdocs and probably experience as a postdoc was you're so anxious about getting your career going and having a job that you can't just enjoy at the purest sense doing research for research's sake. So that sense of having unsupervised playtime and those moments when you go down to the microscope to take a look at a new result. I can remember my graduate supervisor, Derek Vanderkoy, having me look at the development of the striatum, and we got to the point where I realized that the events I was interested in occurred during embryogenesis, not postnatally. And I came and told him that, and he said, well, okay, why don't you go look embryonically? And I kind of looked at him and just very sarcastically said, because I've never done embryonic surgery and I don't have a clue how to do it. And he just said, well, so what's stopping you? And I kind of walked out <laughs> thinking, are you kidding me? And then I you know, kind of self-taught myself how to do embryonic surgery so I could start looking at this. And the first time I went to a microscope with uh, embryos that I had manipulated by doing retrograde tracing on, and I could see the earlier steps of this and that I really was going to be able to get at the heart of this, that was a thrilling memory I'll, I'll never lose. In the last five years, what do you think is the most compelling neuroscience discovery or technique? Yeah, I think a lot of people would probably jump on and say optogenetics because to have light controlled precision of brain activity is an utterly amazing thing. So uh, that's certainly very, very impressive. Well, if I'm going to give a shout out to something slightly different, there's a method that Brian Roth has championed among others which is sometimes referred to as reverse pharmacogenetics. And he uses some called DREDS, which are designer receptor exclusively activated by designer drugs. This has been furthered by Scott Sternson at Genelia. The ability to control cells using drugs rather than light, I think may ultimately prove more profound for disease and for model systems. And the reason is that optogenetics for all its strengths demands that you can deliver highly concentrated beams of light, deliver photons to where you want. And I think the answer is going to be that that is going to be very hard to use clinically and to some extent even in model systems like mice, not as amenable to real-time manipulations as the ability to give a drug to the animal to activate receptors you've installed in cells to create drug switches rather than light switches in changing their activity. But in both cases, the excitement in neuroscience is that we finally reached the point that with genetics and these tools, we can in real-time manipulate activity of cells, and I think that's a game changer. Is there a neuroscientist that you admire? There are many neuroscientists I admire. The one that came to mind immediately was David Anderson because he's basically started his career wanting to work on stem cells, done a wonderful job, and at some point recognized that he wanted a higher mountain to climb and went on to the wiring of emotion and understanding how emotion is processed in the brain. And he's been fearless, and I have to say I admire him enormously for that. And if you weren't a neuroscientist, what would you be? Unemployed. <laughs> I'm sure I'd find something to do. I can't imagine <laughs> anything more fun to do than being a scientist. I do have aspirations that one day I'll, I'll write. Frankly, I'm not sure I'm a great neuroscientist. I'm even less confident that my writing skills are up to the task. But uh, I would at some point like to write some fiction, frankly. And if you weren't in lab, what yeah. would you be seen doing? The other thing I really enjoy doing is anything to do with the wilderness. I do a lot of sea kayaking. So we've done the experiment, and when I'm not in the lab, I'm usually out on a sea kayak. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't even know East Coast had possibilities for kayaking. Oh, I'm you West Coast chauvinists. 
<laughs> yeah, there's lots of opportunity for sea kayaking here. So now we're going to move on to something even more fun. It's called the lightning round. What would you pick, coffee or tea? Coffee. What do you think is a hidden talent in you? Sense of humor. <laughs> That's good. What is your go-to comfort food? Sushi. What's your most favorite place in the world and why? Probably Heron Island, Maine, which is a family place my wife's family has because I just go there to recharge, get away, and think about my science and enjoy nature. If there were a dead person that you'd like to meet and get advice from, who would that be? Alan Turing. Do you prefer PDF versions of papers or a printout version of papers? PDF. What do you think is closer to your heart, your first ever first author publication or your first ever last author publication? Oh, I don't think anyone loves anything more than their first author publications. <laughs> that is true. Well, that actually wraps up our interview, and thank you so very much for interviewing with us. Oh, my pleasure.